Hey guys, it's uh, Mark with a quick overview of the learner guide for CHCCSL004 research and applied personality and development theories. I'm not going to keep this uh, presentation too technical or make it too technical and keep it too long. Uh, I just want to run you through the basics of um, personality development and also the importance in counseling. Now, many students ask me uh, how they should apply this and, and if I still apply this in practice, uh, the short answer is um, you should apply it and yes, I still apply it in practice. Now, on the other hand, I don't think I apply it in the way that the practicals that are associated with this unit want you to apply it and I'll, I'll explain that. Obviously, uh, in the course, we do things a little bit more technical than what you're probably doing in real life for trying to actually get a skill out. So when you get to the practicals that are associated with 004, you'll probably do more than what you would do in real life. And that's OK. It's just to make sure you test, you test your skill. On the other hand, um, if I look at my own practice and I've been practicing practicing counseling and coaching for the last 11 years or so, or 12 years nearly, since 2005. Uh, I am still using parts of person de personality development theories or personality and development theories in my practice when I'm trying to find out what happened to a client and trying to find out why they are behaving or um, why they are showing certain characteristics uh, when they present to me. So it's, it's definitely important to know. Now, some of it is, is old school, some of it is, no, is new school, and I'll go through them relatively quick. But you know, in order to know something about it is always a good, uh, a good thing to, to stay with and learn a little bit more than you pro probably would use in practice. It's just good to have that knowledge. So here we go. We'll have to scroll through the beginning bits a bit. Now, why is personality development important in counseling anyway? Well, in order for you to uh, have a, a strong grip on why a client is showing certain characteristics or why they have a certain personality and why do they or behave a certain way. In order to predict all that and predict an outcome based on that, you need to know how people have developed over time. You know, that allows you to make a good case conceptualization. That's all what's uh, explained on page 12. And that piece of McLeod there, McLeod is one of the, the counseling gods, if you will. So in order to do a good case conceptualization, finding out what happened to a client, how come they still present with that stuff, uh, what uh, made them behave like that, what keeps them behaving like that, what strengths do they have, what barriers are there against making changes, what have they done before, etc., etc. In order for you to make a good conceptualization of that case, it's good to know a little bit about personality and personality development. Now, that's all what's uh, explained here. Read through it. One of the major important parts I find is that piece by McLeod. It's a really good book, actually. I think the 2013 is the introduction to counseling. And introduction, I say with emphasis, because I think the book is about 500 pages thick or whatever. But it's a solid reference book. I've got it uh, now that I'm doing my master's. And uh, yeah, McLeod writes really good stuff. And my lectures uh, seem to sort of you know, bow to him as well. So read that stuff that gives you an idea of case conceptualization. Um, on page 13, you'll read that the learner guide or the, the people that wrote the learner guide think it's a good idea to have some knowledge on how to apply personality and personality development in, in practice. And that's absolutely true. Uh, I think you should understand the theoretical foundations of personality and human development across people's lifespan because some things are fairly predictable. Um, you don't want to generalize too much, obviously, because we're still unique beings. But some things in our upbringing and in the way we grow up as human beings are just fairly universal and fairly generic uh, across the board for everyone. So when you have that solid theoretical background, uh, it allows you to practice in a way that's, that's more evidence-based, so research-based. And, and that's obviously a good thing. Because we're still uh, fighting against a psychologist who think that counselors are just their cheap cousin, whereas counseling actually has way more value um, 
because of what I call in the trenches experience, we're doing the stuff. But it's handy if we can back that up by some research rather than thinking that certain things we do are just a good idea. And I hope that makes sense. Now, what is personality development or what is human development? You'll see a good definition of that in your learner guide. Development is a word given to describe a person's patterns of growth, change and stability in behavior across their lifespan, according to Feldman. And the theories of human development help counselors understand how people change and grow across the lifespan and what factors may potentially influence this process, both in positive and negative ways. And that's exactly it. So many of the issues that you'll find that clients bring to the counseling table are a result of changes across lifespan. Yeah, and that's, that's something you'll find on page 14. Uh, teenage years are often a tricky time for human beings to go through. I know my teenage years weren't the best uh, in terms of you know, feeling insecure about myself and not knowing what I wanted to do with life, really. Uh, when I look back, I can probably smile and then go like, geez, that was interesting. But as I went through it, I wish my mother had known a little bit more about that sort of stuff, uh, even though she meant really well. She probably could have helped me quite a bit. Uh, also, midlife is, is a major factor in, in human change where lots of things happen and lots of dramatic changes take place in your life in terms of purpose. What do you want to do with the second half of your life? Uh, do you want to do something with the second half of your life or do you just want to bludgeon, you know, relax and retire and whatever it is? Uh, and that could cause you know, midlife crisis or sort of the, the 50s blues, as I sometimes like to call them. And by considering all those theories you know, that surround that, counsellors will have a better understanding of the various difficulties that clients will present with when they come into your office. So definitely read up on that one. Okay, I'll scroll through this. This is more like a background image more than anything because I won't really talk about it much. Okay, nature versus nurture. Here we get into the three or four that I want to just quickly discuss and uh, show you their importance for counselling. I don't necessarily want you to do much with it, but we'll get to that. Nature versus nurture, really, it's, it's a fairly simple theory in that sense. Um, it describes the question, are we determined by our nature and or are we determined by our upbringing, social forces? You can read up on it. Uh, the simple answer is both. You know, both have a, a big influence. Obviously, there is a form of what they call generic inheritance, and that's described in here. You know, there is something going on with, with genetics that definitely will influence us. Is that the determining factor? Absolutely not. Not only. There's way more going on than just genes and genetics. There's absolutely also the nurture factor uh, that helps. But when you read on page 16, about the genetic factors, there's definitely a strong influence. You know, so intellectual functioning, about 50% of it is is uh, genetic. You know, temperament and personality, 40%. Fairly big numbers. Uh, psychological disorder, well, there's no real um, percentage there other than that 87% 87 of children who are at increased risk do uh, due to their genetic inheritance, do not go on to develop schizophrenia. So funnily enough, that says that people who genetically should be predisposed to schizophrenia, the majority doesn't get it. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that genetics will lead to something. It's the predisposition for maybe something that's based on genes. But then the study of epigenetics, that's EPI, epigenetics, which I highly recommend you do some more of your personal research into, actually says, well, genes are just what they are. You know, genes, we can actually, and they don't dictate us, we can actually switch genes off and speed them up or shut them down based on our upbringing, based on our social environment. So that's when nurture comes in as a factor. You know, the way we behave and the way we think has a massive influence on our genetic expression. So therefore, nature only is not a good determinant for personality or development as such. And ultimately, you know, the book, the learner guide will say, our development is a combination of both genetic and environmental factors. And that's how I think it is, but you know, what I think is not really important. <laughs> okay, moving on. 
Okay, psychoanalytic, psychodynamic approach. Now, that's good old Sigmund Freud. Now, Freud, yeah, excuse my French, but he was an idiot. Um, he was a chain-smoking uh, cigar smoker who pretty much ignored all the advice of his doctor who said he was at severe risk of developing cancer and ultimately did and had to have all sorts of operations and ultimately died of mouth cancer, uh, probably in an assisted suicide where he got three shots of morphine by his... Uh, you know, his house physician uh, that put him to sleep to the point that he never woke up. Uh, the guy was also into uh, a little known substance at that point, uh, cocaine, which he really thought helped him. And even smoking, he said, helped him be creative. Well, who knows? It's just not that good for your body. He was an interesting guy. And uh, let's, let's, let's keep it at that. Um, his theory, as I said in the beginning, some are a bit outdated. His theory, in a sense, is outdated. Uh, there are not many people anymore who will use uh, Sigmund Freud's, or let, let's put it this way, most contemporary psychodemic counselors will not apply Freud's original development stages to their practice. So there are still psychodynamic approaches, but Freud's original ideas uh, have been, well, superseded, whatever you want to call it, have been surpassed, have been changed, and have been morphed and made more modern doesn't mean that his theories don't have value. They are definitely the foundation of everything. Like the Wright brothers bought the first plane out, so all the other planes are based on it. And a Model T Ford was one of the first cars, and all the other cars are based on it. So it's definitely good to know a little bit about Freud and his ideas in order to understand what current modern psychodynamic psychoanalytic approaches are. But you don't have to go too far into it. Um, a couple of things that are interesting to know about Freud's theory. He talked about the id, the ego, and the superego. The simple way to understand it, for me anyway, is that the id is the child, you know, the ego is the adult, and the superego is the parent. And you can pretty much see in what sort of relationship they stand to each other. The child, the id, just wants stuff. And it wants it now. I want to have it now. I don't want to have it yesterday. I want to have it now. I want to have it now. The adult is the more rational thinking, um, let's call it compromise making uh, personality in us that has some, let's call a bit more, um, well, a bit more adult streaks, obviously, just a bit more logical. Whereas the parent is the, the person or the personality part of our personality that sets the rules, that says things should be a certain way, uh, is our conscience, you know, dictates our values. Uh, dictates how we should be doing stuff. That's that's a way that you can pretty much remember it. The learner guide talks about you know, emotions, moods, drives, playfulness, and behaving. That's the child or the id in Latin. You know, logic, planning, problem solving, peacekeeping, and umpiring. Adult and moralizing, criticizing, bossing, blaming, and punishment are the parent. As long as you can remember that, you'll be pretty good. Uh, for you know, understanding Freud because he pretty much bases everything on that. Now, most of what Freud talks about is um, based on the subconscious. So he says pretty much all our problems are uh, subconscious problems. So when we progress through the four developmental stages that Freud describes and a latent stage, so an inactive stage, he says... Uh, progress is driven by biological maturation. So it's a genetic blueprint that drives us to go through those developmental stages. Uh, we can't do much about that. It's happening purely subconsciously. It just happens. And uh, what happens is as we move through those phases, the id's impulses and social demands come into conflict. So they start to uh, balk against what their parents do, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the problems pretty much uh, lie. It's not only the parents, it's also society, obviously. Now, Freud thought it was the parents' job to make sure that kids you know, grew up to be rational human beings and good human beings. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it's it's our own job. Parents definitely play a big role, but it's more than just the parents that, that have to do it, obviously. The psychosocial, so not psychosocial, that's Ericsson. The psychosexual stages that uh, Freud described were oral, anal, phallic, latent, and genital. I just 
advise you to read up on it. Again, his ideas are relatively outdated, even though they've been modernized. It's good to know about it. You know, a couple of those classic uh, thumb sucking, definitely oral stage, you know, phallic stage, being interested in genitalia like kids are, can sometimes lead, you know, to sexual problems as adults. Uh, you can trace a couple of those classic ones back probably. But really, you know, you want to do some proper research into modern psychodynamic approaches to get the latest on that. And don't just sweep everything, you know, don't, don't use a, a big sort of comb approach and just sweep everything over it. It doesn't really work that way anymore. So read up on uh, good old Freud. There's plenty on it. Um, I don't think you'll have to use it in one of your pracs because, like I said, it's, it's slightly outdated, but it's good to know about it. Erickson, on the other hand, which is a little bit further down the track, Eric Erickson, definitely one of the ones that are still you know, current in a sense. What Erickson said is that there are predictable life stages that people go through. You know, there's, it's not necessarily biological drivers like what Freud thought, but it's more social factors like friends and family, work, relationships, you mentioned them. So that's why his theory is called the psychosocial theory. It has to do with his psychology, you know, psychological needs, but it's definitely socially driven. And according to good old Erickson, each of the stages is a crisis moment where a crisis develops and you go through that one. If you don't go through that one, then that can cause problems later on in life. Now, read through them again. Uh, there's plenty of information, good information and learner guides. So I'm not going to go too much in depth on that. Just read on all the, the phases and the crisis development or the crisis point and the development that's in there. So you can do your own reading. Uh, let me have a look what I want to discuss in terms of Ericsson. Oh, yeah, he actually put quite a bit of emphasis on the adolescent period because he said that's when a lot of changes in people's lives take place. Um, and another important stage was the midlife period of the lifespan, according to Erickson. Now, how does that work out in counseling? Well, uh, where are we in the life cycle? That would be question number one to answer uh, of our clients. Or where do, where do you sit? You know, or, or as a counselor, can you find out where your client sits? And are you, as a client, adapting to the crisis, to use Erickson's word, that's actually taking place in that lifespan? Are you adapting properly? You know, to your age group. If not, then that can cause a problem. If so, then you learn to become a balanced human being. And Erickson believed that poorly resolved crises could definitely be resolved at later stages. So um, as counselors, we're not necessarily resolving issues from the past anymore. We're trying to develop skills and strengths for the future. Um, where Erickson sort of falls over in my perspective is that he doesn't really prescribe any specific interventions to use. It's more up to us to, to find out what stage the client is at and, and what you could do. Now, there's obviously lots of things that you can find on the internet now and in research material, uh, so that doesn't have to pose a problem. But it makes it really hard to sort of say, okay, yep, you're definitely stuck in the trust versus mistrust uh, area, uh, and therefore I think it's a good idea if we start doing this and this. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a tough call to make because how do you know for sure? So I don't use it all that much in in my practice in order to um, help people put things into place, but you definitely can. I don't use it as an intervention per se. I will ask it to to get a grip on you know why people have become the way they are. You know what element of maybe Ericsson or Piaget, which I'll discuss very shortly, they seem to be stuck in. And what you can do about it. So I use it that sense, but not really formally. Uh, I would definitely need more training. I know a little bit about it, but I would definitely need more training if I want to do that well. That much for Ericsson. Good old Balby. I think he was called John. I can't even remember. John Balby? I think it's John. Doesn't matter. Uh, attachment theory. That's, that's a really cool theory in my masters. We're going to spend quite some time on that one. Uh, in second semester. I'm quite looking forward to it. I don't understand it really well. I didn't really. Uh, I still think I don't understand it fully, but I understand the concepts of it. And I think uh, Balbi's got a, a good point in, in uh, talking what he's talking about. So attachment theory, in a sense, 
suggest that personality and behaviors relate to the images of significant people and then most likely the parents that we have in our heads. So uh, when you look at you know, the attachment, and that's where the word comes from, obviously, a detachment from children to their primary caregivers, mainly their mothers, uh, they will follow suit. Yeah, so the relationship with our parents and our primary caregivers uh, will, will obviously form attachments. And those attachment behaviors uh, are reinforced by our parents. So you know, when we do something good, we get reinforced by that. Uh, when we cry, then closeness will be restored. You know, we don't feel close. Something's happened. And normally, if uh, care and responsiveness is given by the parents, then that closes the cycle again and everything is okay. Now, again, long story short, attachment theory um, looks or looks into a couple of directions and we say, look, there are secure, avoidant and resistant attachments defend, depending on how we were brought up. And please read up on that on page 27 and onwards. I'll open that one up here. Yeah, so if we are positive and loved, then we form secure attachments with our parents, mainly our mother. If we are unloved and rejected, then we form avoidant attachment you know, with other people and ourselves. And if we're angry and confused, then we form resistant attachments. Now, those attachments will play out in later life. That's, that's Balby's theory. And I think there's a fair call on that one. Uh, it definitely happens. We start to treat people you know, the way... Uh, that probably our parents treated us or the way that we reacted towards what our parents did to us. So you've got to realize that, that attachment theory uh, states you know, that early important relationships with caregivers are influential in subsequent emotional well-being. And that's, that's what it's all about. That, that's the realization you want to have, according to Balby anyway. So problems in those early relationships with our parents may then lead to emotional difficulties in the person's sense of self and can also lead to problems in relationships later on. So relationship qualities at each step in development affects relationship quality at the next step. That's, that's what attachment theory says. Um, let me see if I want to discuss anything more about that one. Uh, ah, yep. A quick one on page 30. When we talk about styles. Now, that's an interesting uh, piece of writing there. So read up on it. So how do you work with people? You know, people with secure attachment styles, well, you really don't have to work with them too much because they probably won't even show in your counseling practice because they generally are okay and doing all right. They feel loved. Uh, they're comfortable with emotional attachment and don't see in intimacy as threatening. You, know, you will be working with uh, people with insecure attachment styles and people with the one point down avoidant attachment styles. And in this uh, article and also in reading C, you'll find lots of ways that you can work with that. Again, as with Erickson and as with Freud, if you want to do some serious work into this and, and want to start working really heavily with it, you'll have to do some additional training in, in attachment theory as there's a lot to it. But it's, it's a fascinating way of looking at life. And I think there's, there's a lot of worth in it. Uh, the last one that I want to discuss today, also for your prax. So again, keep in mind when the practicals ask you to um, help the client see how they developed in terms of Piaget stages of cognitive development, well, that's all good and well. You'll probably never really do that in your own practice unless you just enjoy psychoeducation and you want to teach your client stuff. You might bring it up and might say, hey, look, have you ever heard of a guy called yeah, Jean Piaget? No, well, you know, he actually focused on uh, how our thought process development, uh, our processes, no, try that again, how our thought processes develop and how these thought processes influence our standing, understanding of the world around us. And he came up with a couple of stages. Let me talk to you about it and, and see where you think you fit in or whether you think you've met those milestones. That's something you could bring up. Now, good old Piaget, a couple of things, I think, for the assessment to understand as well. Um, is that Piaget said uh, a, child, a child's knowledge is altered via their, their experiences, which makes kind of sense. You know, the more we experience, the more we adapt to our environment. And that's actually what Piaget calls the adaptation phase. So we adapt. And then with adaptation, there are two complementary processes, assimilation, accommodation. 
Assimilation means taking new information in and giving it a spot in your brain, whereas an accommodation means is a modification from uh, of what is already known to in order to fit better with reality. Now keep those three terms in mind. I think there's a question or two about it in the uh, in the assessment. So adaptation, assimilation, and accommodation. Again, I won't uh, discuss the the phases that he talks about too much. But one of the differences with the others is that pretty much, you know, at age 11 onwards, uh, Piaget stops. So looking at the counseling one, you will probably not uh, be applying Piaget's cognitive theory in your counseling all that much unless you want to become a, a developmental psychologist or a developmental counselor. And you'll definitely have to do some more study into this. But what Piaget does say, and that's important for us to know, that each person passes through each stage before starting the next one and no one skips a stage. So you could actually come across a client perhaps who for whatever reason uh, is still working through the formal operational stage, who still hasn't got a full grip on what's happening in life and can't really think abstract or hypothetically, who just has major issues with that. And if that's you know, what you come across, then you can definitely think back of good old Piaget and say, hmm, righto, there's something going on here in terms of his, up, uh, his, his theory that I'll have to use in my counseling practice. So that's, that's what I want to leave it with. There's more on it, all interesting stuff. And the last one I want to discuss real quickly is Abraham Maslow. Most of you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, so I'll, I'll discuss it fairly quick. Uh, Maslow is more part of the existential humanistic approaches, so humanistic psychology, um, whereby, or not not whereby, um, existential humanistic theories state that the human capacity for creativity, growth, uh, and choice is there. So we all have that, and that we are not um, not governed in a way by unconscious forces. Yeah, we have a, an inborn tendency to self-realize and actualize or fulfill our potential. And if we are allowed the environment to do that in, then we will grow. Yeah, and that's the, the triangle that Maslow has come up with. So he focuses more on motivation rather than development. It's more a motivational uh, theory. Now, I agree with, with much of what Maslow says. You know, I think there is definite you know, sort of step steps towards self-actualization. On the other hand, I don't think it's only step-by-step you know, -step actualization processes. To give you a real quick example, I've met people who I think are completely self-actualized who uh, don't have a house to sleep in and hardly eat or have not much food, but they're just happy. You know, They've been able to overcome whatever problems they had to come to accept the world as it is and their place in the world as it is. I really don't need all that stuff. And I've seen people uh, who seem to be working on the social needs and friendship and family phase you know, because they have the rest, but they're, well, let's use plain English, screwed up as, yeah, and are really living from a survival point of view. So they seem to have everything. They seem to have a car, seem to have friends, seem to have work. You know, all seems well on the outside. But really, when you look at it, they're living on a survival uh, level and they might constantly be looking for you know, more foods or more stuff or more things to have in order to feel safe. So it's it's not always the case that you do the, the physiological levels first and then move up to safety and security, etc. Sometimes you do and, and sometimes you can recognize that. But sometimes people jump through the phases or uh, actually skip complete phases and don't even worry about that. You know, some people are just not interested in where they live or what what they live in or under, uh, as long as they can become self-actualized and go for that. So um, the self-actualization thing being up top and therefore the last uh, element of uh, our motivational strategies, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but it's still very interesting to learn from. And I think when you look at this, this theory, this is one you can actually quite easily use with clients. Again, don't use it as a law, as something that is the way it is, and this is how it is. But definitely use it in terms of helping clients understand what's going on you know, and help them 
uh, understand their life a bit, a little bit better, and and maybe find out where they're at, and drawing lines between higher and lower, and work towards perhaps higher stages. You can do that, and, and that would definitely work. You know, so Maslow said that if lower level needs aren't met, then we cannot direct our energies to for, uh, fulfilling higher level needs. Well, I don't know, uh, but work with it because clients generally understand this quite easily and it makes good sense. And it can also lead to a nice piece of goal setting if you know that someone hasn't got a roof over their heads and therefore they live on survival mode. Well, maybe you can help them refer to some housing or you know, shelters or whatever, emergency housing, etc., etc. So you can use it quite easily. So that's all I want to discuss for this one. It's just an, a, a quick overview of the 004 Learner Guide. Um, there's a research section in there as well. That's to give counseling and the counseling industry more oomph still. Definitely do your research and read that section, obviously, and answer the questions that might be in, in the assessment guide. But at least you'll have a, a fairly quick overview of you know, what personality and development theory is all about. So do your good work with it. And again, don't be too frazzled and upset with uh, your practical. I don't need to see it all done you know, religiously per se, as long as you discuss the theory, give me a good example and help the client through whatever they're doing using either Piaget or Ericsson, whomever you've chosen, I'm fine. What I do want to see is a proper counseling session. So use of micro skills, you know, paraphrasing what the client says, reflect the feelings, summarize it every now and then, open questioning, lots of open questioning, and then using the, the theory that the practical is all about. So I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, pretty close to half an hour, so that was good. Uh, keep working hard, guys. 20 December is the deadline, and I look forward to speaking with you all very soon. See ya.